Hi, everybody. This is Saurav from Hello Tomorrow, and I'll be your host for this evening. I welcome everybody to today's webinar on how to accelerate new materials discovery, how to explore the chemical universe efficiently. What does this mean? To explain and to discuss this further, today we have with us Dr. Jill S. Becker, Master's and PhD in Chemistry from prestigious Harvard University. She's also the CEO of Cabotex. We'll get to know a lot more about Cabotex in our discussion today. But just to warm up the audience here today, Cabotex was a previous finalist of Hello Tomorrow Global Challenge in 2020. Their technology is at the forefront of discovering new materials and chemicals by using artificial intelligence and robotics. By the way, Cabotex just announced a few hours ago a collaboration with Mitsubishi Chemical to tackle toxicity. The initial project will focus on discovering a substitute for bisphenol A. What a great endeavor, Jeff. In fact, this allows one of the many, this follows one of the many exciting efforts you have recently announced. Last week, you had an announcement with the National Science Foundation. You announced Cabotex was selected as industry partner for a new 15 million institute funded by National Science Foundation, led by Colorado School of Mines. You also made an announcement that Cabotex artificial intelligence has discovered a new electrochromic material for smart window applications after analyzing 7 million molecules. Cabotex already has collaborations with organizations from all over the world, Bio and Crop Protection, Johnson Methe, Cura, the National Institutes of Health, Northeastern University, to name just a few. Thank you for joining here today at Hello Tomorrow. We are also bringing Massimo Potencastle, the chairman of Hello Tomorrow, and the deep tech expert in this webinar. Massimo has previously worked as managing director and partner at BCG. He has been associated with Hello Tomorrow since its early days. We will start a discussion which will be around 35 minutes and then we will take questions from the audience for around 10 to 15 minutes. Feel free to add your questions in the questions tab and I will make sure to raise them to Jill and Massimo. Over to you, Jill and Massimo. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, Jill, it's super to have you back here at the Little Tomorrow after last year's finals. And I'm really excited about this conversation because there's been a lot of talking about uh, synthetic biology and what we call at Low Tomorrow Nature co-design. And we have seen a lot of investment in this space and a lot of advancement with the design, build, test, learn cycle. But to me, a little bit of the Cinderella in this space compared to what is happening on synthetic biology is uh, the inorganic side of nature co-design, which is the space that Kebotics occupies. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about Kebotics, your unique approach, and how you're trying to do to synthetic biology what maybe Simergen and Ginkgo have done to synthetic biology? Sure thing. So Zymergen and Ginkgo are platform companies for synthetic biology. And we decided coming out of a Harvard chemistry, we were going to be a platform company with where we know what we're doing, and that is chemistry. And I do, and I know Ginkgo and Zymogen both know this because I've spoken to them over the years. I do believe what the world really needs is a combination of a platform company that has both synthetic biology and chemistry underneath one roof. And the reason for that is because if you think how something is made best, usually defined highest yield, lowest cost, Purity often matters, and a few other factors. Sometimes some of the process steps will be better made in a synthetic bio way, and some can only be made in a chemical way. But for now, I have to do what I'm good at, and that is chemistry. Um, we, have, we wanted to take AI and machine learning that we've seen for facial recognition, for text recognition, um, and apply it to the world of chemistry. And we wanted to be the chemical company of the 21st century with our 21st century tools. And we wanted to take the serendipity out of science in order to speed up and bring products to market better. So in 2019, I got a seven-figure check for something that I invented in 1999. It should not have to take 20 years to 
commercialize a good idea in the chemical and materials industry. And that's just a personal example, and I'm not bragging. That money went straight to my ex-husband. So, but the point is, as a grad student, I invented something that was worth, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars for Harvard, yet it took almost two decades to commercialize. And that is just frustrating. I mean, the productivity chasm, we all know about it. Chemical companies are really good at what they're doing, supply chain management, selling and making of chemicals, and they spend more than $150 billion a year on R&D, and a lot of that is wasted. It's too long, too costly, takes more than a decade to bring really not just a chemical to market, but that is, isn't a product. And the product manufacturers have huge needs for new materials, as you're seeing with some of our recent press releases. So we decided to think about how to reinvent how to invent in order to bring R&D to scale. And before we incorporated the company, what we really wanted to do is really build this lab of the future, what we call the self-driving lab. And it is really the scientific method. You start just like a chemist would in property prediction. But instead of a chemist asking a question or having a hypothesis, we have very strong chem informatics, material informatics, predicting what you should be making with the properties of interest. There's some optimization going on, and that's great. And many companies in the world are at that stage. And you can predict until the cows come home. At some point, you have to make it. You have to actually, you need that feedback loop. Did it work, right? We do this as humans all the time. We have an idea. We want to have, you know, our minimum viable product as soon as possible so that we can get to a stage of go, no go. We also invented something called reaction sage. That's our synthetic route predictor. Cause you would imagine you'd have to think about not only th dreaming up a new chemical, you have to think about now how to make this. So this reaction sage will tell you, our partners or our robots, how to make the top candidates. And of course, there, all that data is generated, all the metadata, and we keep all that in our secure cloud, which we also built. And now the chemicals made, we have a robotic suite that tests just like a chemist would. Did you make what you said you're gonna make and does it have the properties of interest? And then we're left with the actual winners that are ready for prototyping. And that's where we are today. And uh, there's a lot of tools and technology that goes into it. But this, and we don't need all the tools to be able to really help our customers bring R&D to scale. And I can go into more details in a bit, but I'll start. So, you know, um, what is now specific about this point in time that allowed you to do this? You know, when I look at synthetic biology, so if I go back and forth between synthetic biology and chemistry, but I think it helps to frame uh, the discussion. But when you look at synthetic biology, it was about the next generation sequencing, new methods to do gene editing, or things about synthesis. What was the trigger that allowed you to do things that were not doable before? What are the secret sources that are coming here? Is it about the AI, is the robotics? I think it has to do with the computing as a whole, with being able to create, calculate, and store that amount of data. It is the AI, machine learning, um, Gaussian processes, all that learning that's been applied in other areas. That is why I think now is the time, or a few years was the time, to really get started on that. When it comes to the self-driving lab, one of the reasons we thought we could do it is because a lot of the equipment that chemists are used to using, which are massive, like an NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, you put an NMR tube in there, it's a giant magnet, needs to be cooled, uh, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, is giant, you know, like six feet, and I don't know how, how much it weighs. That's now a bench top. You can buy that bench top. So now we have a moving robot that can move uh, the chemical samples around. We have things that move and shake. And uh, 
I thank pharma for that, actually. Pharma has been almost very hip in their drug discovery. And there's a lot of equipment that we can buy from pharma in order to do the synthesis that we're doing in the chemical space. So it was the convergence of seeing and believing that the scientific method could be um, automated and improved upon. And by improvement, we were really looking for finding the best candidates at the fastest speed. And when it comes to the method, do you put more emphasis in expanding the optional space, utilizing AI and coming out with new molecule? Or what is really boosting you is the capacity to go through this self-learning cycle quickly? Because one of the kind of hidden secrets when, when you look at uh, synthetic biology is really that uh, the robotics and the automation is what allows you to go from the 96 trays, as I trace, to 10,000 in one day. So it's really orders of magnitude increased throughput that allows you to find more. Is it for you that you say, yeah, actually we can do it faster, but it's not that, and we're more focused on the AI, or you just really come up with multiple things and you test, test, test till you find, or synthesize until um, you find what, what you need to do? So when it comes to helping our partners where we use our software tools, we're pretty agnostic as to what we're looking at. We're usually trying to help them find some sort of a deliverable, maybe ranking of chemicals that they had already dreamt up to save them hundreds of thousands of dollars and years in the making saying, make this, if you want these properties, make this, this and that, or top 10 synthetic routes. For ourselves, when we invent chemicals internally, we, you can see that the total addressable market for kabotics really is, is infinite. And at the same time, being able to do the lab of the future autonomously, we grouped all the markets in easier to make and harder to make, easier to predict and harder to predict. And anything with a biological function usually is a little bit more difficult because it requires mm -hmm. more different types of data, including toxicity. So right now, for ourselves, the materials that we invent for ourselves to sell and license, we play in what we call the easy, easy quadrant. So easy to predict, easy to make. Things like high-performance pigments, whether that's used for an um, electronic application like uh, nylon covering, electronic electrical connectors all the way to the partnership we did with Northeastern where it, we're inventing high performance pigments for photodynamic cancer therapy. So that would imply that you would need a pigment that reacts in order to kill the cancer where light isn't present. We're also doing that for OLEDs and electrochromics and we're obviously always expanding that. At the same time, one of our submission is to have the most powerful AI software in all of chemical space. And we think of that as our AI brain, which would include in the future synthetic biology. Now, if you imagine how big chemical space is, my brain kind of breaks down. I think of it as like 10 to the 60, 10 to the 80. If you then would take all the patents in the world when it comes to chemicals, and let's just include pharma, they look like tiny little dots in all of this chemical space. And we wanted something that starts to think in areas no human has ever thought of. Um, what was the remainder of your question? It's just whether you are just going for testing more and finding oh. out of it, or you design from the very beginning, knowing that those are the things that you're coming up with things that others haven't uh, we, we, experienced. We do, yeah, we do that and more. One of the things that we really like to do right now, we have a very strong prediction of properties. We are looking at more than 27 million commercially available chemicals and doing sort of a needle in the haystack search, having the AI find a new use case that we can patent, whether that's in pigments, OLEDs, electrochromics. So that sounds pretty, I think, exciting. I believe there's a lot of big chemical companies that have reinvented the wheel because 
perhaps data is not captured as well as it, it should. And it would be exciting for them to know where else they could have this chemical that they know how to make. They can make it successfully, they can make it cheaper or uh, cheaply, where else they could sell this. So in our case, we patented the use case and then our AI is set up to dream up a library of new candidates where we own both the structure case IP and the use case IP. Mm. So you see yeah. that we did both. We found value in existing chemicals that you can buy. And here you can see that the, our lab is slightly different. We predict, we buy, we test. It's a little bit different, still creates a lot of value. There's and other things that we sorry, do. Um, like we can do access a lab remotely to optimize things. For example, for the National Center for Advanced Translational Sciences, this is part of the NIH. They have these giant yellow robots that do nothing but testing for viruses and pretty much nothing but COVID these days. And they have these enzyme assays that they run all day long and their brute force design of experiment takes them 49 hours to do. Remotely, we managed to reduce that down to nine hours, giving them 40 more hours to save lives. And because everything is kind of set up to be optimized, we managed to reduce the amount of enzyme that they needed also by a factor of five. Now, this might not sound sexy, as, oh, we just dreamt up this, this chemical that, that the world will use over and over again. That still takes time, but it's not gonna take the two decades or the one decade that it has been. And as long as we can reduce the cost, increase the speed, take the uncertainty out of your outcomes, and at the end of the day, what we really care about is bringing better products to market faster that benefit us. I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I'm, I'm so happy that, that you're going after this. That said, one of the things that the most that operate in this space are struggling with is the cost dimension, because the chemical industry literally has been around for more than 100 years, and a lot of processes have been refined, and all the efficiencies have been taken out of the system. So that at times, uh, uh, even if you have a product which is better, it's difficult to get something which is better and cheaper um, in many cases. So how do you play with, with these kind of, I wouldn't say contradiction, but it's, it's a bit of a dichotomy um, that you have and you're competing with a phenomenal uh, competitor that has literally a century of experience curve under its belt. Um, what's the way that you're dealing with it? Well, I actually don't think of them as a competitor. I think of them as a partner. Okay. And I think that um, they're all aware that digitalization is here. I think people were working towards it and COVID kind of showed them like, we got to be working on this now. And a lot of these companies have, you know, digital teams internally. I, I don't think they're very big teams. So it's more about how can we help them usher in a new age of innovation? How can we help them reduce the costs? And um, they're willing to work with us and we're willing to work with them. I think there's trillions and trillions of dollars to be had here, with no need to be greedy. Um, I'm also hoping, I mean, they don't have to work with Kabotics. These companies have to realize that chemical materials industry is going to have a renaissance of output thanks to AI, machine learning, robotics, and more and more powerful computation. And I can't wait for the day that quantum computing is here because that will increase what we do as well. I think we need to start to think about it as how can we raise everybody up holistically um, have diversity of thought, which, like it or not, the AI does provide at, at, a, at a speed that we humans can't match, in order to ethically move us forward as humans, because we have massive problems. Indeed, we have. Um, my, my question would be, but do you think that it's going to be a situation similar to the one with the auto industry, where you had 
100 year old companies that are really struggling to embrace this change and move down that road. Because if I look at the, the market, you know, you have Bayer, 100 over here, BSF, Dow, Old Dupont, all these names are really children of the first and second industrial revolution. And will they be able to embrace or will it take and need a, a, a Tesla of chemistry to come and change this space or Google or call it the way you want it? If they work with us or not, that's really up to them. We're open to these partnerships. Um, you're right. When you get that large, you, it, you know, you're, you're just really good at what you do. I mean, you can see that as an example. Sometimes the mutual NDA can take quite some time. Um, a lot of these things are more politics. And I think fear, fear of spearheading something. I'm always looking to build strong internal champions inside these companies. And we don't want to take anyone's job. We want to improve the jobs that uh, take out the redundancy of jobs. I mean, if you have a lab that requires, you know, 30 technicians and our AI can have each piece of equipment running at um, optimum process parameters, maybe you just need 10 process uh, technicians and the other ones can go get their masters in chemistry and start to be more creative in helping. There's, there's always human input in what we build. It doesn't need to be, but we'd like there to be human input. And one of the things we also really like what we set up is that the AI, you can um, tell it that this is bad data. Like you don't want it to look like this for a variety of reasons. Let's say you, you know that the patent portfolio is full in this area. So you, or, or it has a moiety that you'd like rather not have in the landfill or your body or a water table. The other thing though it captures, which I always wished as a, as a scientist myself, you know, there isn't a journal where you, it says um, stuff I tried and it didn't work, right? No one has ever published that. And that's because these are, we're all in a sense a for-profit company or society and we have egos. But imagine if we, as a society, were slightly different, right? You can see it in cooking. Like I actually, to... actually, they yeah. just launched a, a, a journal. It's called the Journal of Trial and Error, and Ooh. I think the Utrecht University launched it. I think it's an amazing thing because we, you can learn from the negative data way more than you learn from the positive ones. Exactly, yeah. and that's the same with uh, um, my daughter. I think just failed her first test and I said, you know, how do you feel about it? And she's like, I thought I was going to cry. And she, I'm like, the world didn't explode, did it? And she's like, no. And I'm like, we learn the most from our failures. I, I really believe that's true. Uh, it's a shame sometimes that as a society, we think because someone failed, you know, we need to cast them aside. But I think those people have much more. They'll never do that again. And that's one of the things I really like to do is, is talk to people about their failures or companies about their failures. Because I, then I don't feel like I need to live that myself. Like I, they proved to me that that's probably not the right direction to go. So I know that's not one of the, the choices to do. I'm glad that exists. I've been waiting for it. But one of the things, so all this experimentation is happening. We're capturing all the data and it learns that, oh, that didn't work. So it gets more and more powerful as well. So there's constant interaction and there's also human robot interaction. Like when the lab was semi-autonomous, you know, we get, um, we call it K interacts or robotics interact. You know, someone will perhaps get a text that says, unscrew all the vial caps. <laughs> you know? And then you can hit a button and the robot comes and picks up all the vials and moves it wherever it needs to be. And um, it's, it's, the future is here. And I, I think um, it's wonderful. It's a fun place to work. We are hiring and growing like gangbusters. Um, did a subsidiary in Canada, have people from all over the world. It's been, it's been really great. And last time I checked, we were more than 30% women. So I have some work to do. 
and more than 60% people of color. But I'm redoing the survey in the next couple of weeks because with all the onboarding, we have to see where we're at. Now, back to, to the materials award, I have this dream that, you know, we can really explore and transform into reality a lot of this option space where you said this is 10 at the 60 or 80 and we only have some small dots here and there and we'll start filling that room. But if you start filling it also thanks to Kabotics, we're going to have a place where we have way more materials than we have today, which I hope we, do, we need because we need to solve a lot of problems. Now, Kabotics is a way to get to these problem to to these products, but do you think that the whole way the production side is also done? It's not only about identifying coming up with these materials, but that we're going to have a very, I wouldn't say decommoditized, smaller batches work, more flexible, and you really work and produce for whatever you're doing. You're going to get your specific material um, as they're going through it instead of going with uh, the bulk. Um, production and do you think this is going to have reflection on, on, on the industrial tissue that we're going to have and how this is going to evolve over time because a, a chemical plant today is multiple billions. Do you think this is going to remain down the line if what you're doing continues to be successful or do you think it's going to have more of a distributed uh, view of the world? I think it's a more distributed view of the world and the reason for that is if you have a chemical, you start with the chemicals here and you end with the product here. There are many steps in between. So let's say you predict a chemical, you actually manage to make it. You're still in the chemical space. Now you need to take this chemical or material, you need to put it in some sort of format, a formulation, a thin film, something that allows you to put it in a prototype in order to test it, right? Now the people who buy the parts right? Think supply chains. They don't want things. No, 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 no. This is, this is, you know, what is Intel's motto? Copy exact, right? You don't want anything to mess with that. You want to just look at it and drive the costs out of it. That, that however, whatever thin system you can think of, whatever incentives you can give your, your supply chain vendors, whatever middlemen you can cut out. So they're here now, right? Why on earth would they care about a new chemical? I think in a sense, they don't. There's only three reasons why anyone wants one. It has to be better, but the better needs to actually be defined by the customer. And this is why we always like to hear, what's your problem? Like, what is it about this that you would like better? The formulation, the shine, the this, the that. Um, it has to be at least 15% cheaper. And then I think sometimes it's also FOMO, like fear of missing out, like what's happening on the sneaker scenes, which is blowing my mind, how the sneaker can go for $200 and two seconds later on StockX for $2,000. I'd like that to happen in the chemical world as well. Um, and competition. So, I, and I, there's a strong green sustainability push for all these product manufacturers, whether that is clothing companies. I didn't actually know that some of these clothing Massive clothing companies have their own chemists on staff. Wasn't expecting that. Um, or, or a lot of beauty companies want greener. And I do think, I think the last, we, we absorb through our skin at least about, f I think, five pounds of toxins a year. Because no, th these things aren't very well r regulated. And I think that we should really change. Like, everything from nail polish to hair dye to all sorts of cosmetics. We haven't changed that much since the days of Cleopatra, I think. And do you think that we have a, a chance at really getting, moving away completely from petrochemical, even though we're moving toward the fossil fuel free world and is Kibotics working on these? Yeah, so one of the things we're asking our AI to do right now for these these pigments, because the, the origin from them is petrochemical. We're asking our AI if it by itself can dream up how to make these from biofeedstocks. So that's actually an internal active project that we're doing right now. Um, the price of gas really does affect um, how much we go for green energy or not as, as a culture, as a society, as countries. 
And I think we need to make uh, uh, some decisions what we want to be doing. Uh, the, the disaster outside of California. I mean, how do you even find that leak? Is it double walled tubing? What caused the leak? Um, how are they going to fix it? What's the long term ramification? Has it entered their water? I mean, I was kind of happy I'm living here right now. Um, these disasters have to stop. Now we do, we're a cons we consume like there's no tomorrow. Anything we can consume, we will. <laughs> Whether that's gold on French fries. So I think it's, uh, it's actually an ethical problem more than anything else. If there is a will, we will do it. I don't think we have the will. There's just too much money on the table. And you rightly pointed out to the fact that you're asking your clients about what's the problem that you have. This is the way you should do because the moment you expand the option space, uh, you could go after everything. So you really need to be clear about what are the problems that you're solving. What are the problems that you're most excited about to solve with Kibotics? And what are the ones mm -hmm. that uh, you are seeing most pressure to solve? Ideally, those would over overlap, but I'm not so sure if they do. So I would be curious when it comes to the world um, of materials. So one of the things I'm always looking for when we're helping our partners, I want to see the tools we use because I want our customers to feel like it was customized to them. And that's the death of any small startup. And I want to see that we reuse our tools. That's how powerful they are. So if we're looking at, you know, heat transfer fluid for electric vehicles or things for crop protections, it shouldn't, it sh if you're really trying to build something that has the most powerful thinking in all of chemical space, it, sh it should be agnostic. Sustainability is big, so we want to do that. Our customers want to do that. Anything that solves really big problems. Um, right now, anything to do with, with biofunctionality takes a little bit longer. So since, you know, my job description as a VC-backed company is that I, it's just a one-liner. I have to raise money every 18 to 24 months at minimum double the valuation. So you don't, you don't ask to cure cancer um, in that 18-month piece. You bite something off that you know you and your team can chew on that's very forward-reaching and you can achieve it so that more money, <laughs> you attract more money and more money and more money. So it's a, it's, it's a fine balance. Uh, it's a very interesting job to be a CEO of a complete startup and then grow it and transition it out of the startup phase, which is where we are um, right now. And, and uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. You started the call talking about these 20 years, 1999 is 2021, and that's the time it took for monetize that invention. And the say is materials discovery, material business is a 20 year business. And it's always been also, you know, Bill Janway, uh, a great venture capitalist and thinker says, it's not a business for venture capital because the cycle are too long. And you are, basically as raise money with the promise that you're going to bring this down. When do you think we can get to a two year cycle to develop new materials? So are we already there? And if we're not there yet, what is missing to get to a two year? So maybe one, one, one time a one year cycle. I don't know. Um, I mean, the electrochromics we discovered in commercially available chemicals, we did that in a very short time. I think manually, because it was such a needle in the haystack search, you, you couldn't even guarantee that you'd ever as a human being find that. You're not gonna buy 27 million chemicals. I mean, that's gonna cost you too much. And, and that's the, the, the other problem is, even if you dream up a chemical, synthesizing a chemical usually costs you at least $100. So if you, okay, now you say, I got some computing power, let's do some density functional theory here. It still costs you one to three dollars a chemical. So we had to be able to reduce the cost out of it being a startup that we're about to not be anymore so that we can look at, at millions of molecules over and over and over again for, for a variety of different reasons and continue to grow our data 
to be able to access it a little bit later. Um, the, the, the idea is that the AI would reduce the cost and the number of people. And I'm never hiring 3,000 chemists to, to come make the chemicals that we invent. We will outsource that or we'll do that through a trusted partner. I, I do hope that in the future, and I've done this before through other entities, um, that we invent and our partners host the chemicals in, in their catalogs. I, you know, I, I always loved getting my Sigma Aldrich catalog. Sigma Aldrich doesn't exist anymore, um, but also out of, it was out of Harvard Chemistry and he synthesized his first chemicals in his garage, the total American dream, right? And the cover, if you ever can find it, it was some of the paintings he owned. So it wasn't even anything, well, what in the world isn't chemistry, right? Remember that bumper sticker from a long time ago? And people always used to write on it, love. And I'm like, how is that not chemistry? All those hormones? <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. And you mentioned DFT and uh, the, the word of chemistry is by definition a quantum word when you go down at that level. Um, do you think, and what are your expectations in terms of material developments of, of about quantum computing? Is it going to change the game for you? Or do you think AI is our horse? We're betting on it and this is gonna they're gonna before quantum gets there we're gonna have developed our ai so far that actually we don't need it uh, w no, what is I, your stance on these two fronts for materials de development specifically um the second quantum is ready we want to use it i think it's it's it, it would speed up all our calculations to a point um that i think would be astronomical it's just not ready yet. There's a lot of hype. And, and that's mm -hmm. actually a lot of hype around AI and machine learning. So one of the things I've been doing is actually carting people to our lab to, I want them to know this isn't like make believe. This is like, we, we did that. Like we did this for ourselves. We did that for our customers. Um, so maybe I've fallen in love with the hype with quantum. And at the same time, as a geek inside, I really hope it exists. And as the CEO of, of Kabotics, I really want to use it as soon as possible. Okay. We hope, I think it's going to come there. I think it's a matter of when, not if, at this point in time. I think that it's, it's an engineering challenge at this point in time, but I agree with you. It's not going to be this year. It's not going to be next year for sure. Um, now, that said, um, where do you think the next big push is going to come? If I look at Kebotics now, is it going to be with an acceleration on you know, new algorithms, more computing power, um, more parallel computing, more? Or is it going to be, sorry if I go back to, to, to my initial point, uh, maybe there are going to be some uh, technical developments on the robotic side, on the sensing side that is going to allow you to test more and be more efficient or breakthrough on the process side um, so that you can produce some of this stuff way more easily and gets more adoption. So where do you think are the biggest breakthrough that are going to bring us to this one year uh, and a quicker adoption of new materials that are desperately needed for what we need to do to literally save the world? I think it's on the computing side that I, I want the, the AI to be so good that it can dream up the proper, the winner and think about scaling it up, right? It would be useless if it dreamt something up that you can only make on, on the milligram scale when to change the world, you would be able to think about it on a, you know, you want to sell tons of this stuff. I, I think it's on the, on the computing side the, the robotics is always later. It always comes later. And that is actually a real world engineering problem. I think it's on, on honing in on that most powerful AI brain in all of chemical space. That's, that's the push. And we're seeing that now. And we're improving that on a daily basis. And then it, it's the speed as well. Now there is the um, making and testing and some syntheses are you know, harder to make than others. And um, some of the test requirements for part manufacturers can be quite long. Like some people want to put some stuff out in the desert for two years. You know, that's a little bit, uh, well, you know, how do you speed that up? Um, 
some materials just require that you put them in a humidity chamber to test the, the longevity of it, for example. And some things we just can't do that. So it's, it's, it's a balance uh, and not everything, everything is gonna have some sort of improvement in terms of speed, but some things will be this much quicker and some things will be this much quicker and everything in between. And Jill, um, you know, the same way when uh, synthetic biology came to the market, everybody was betting on biofuels, which was a bloodbath and wrong economics and, and all of those things. But this is also what allowed the field to make a major leap forward. It was not good for the investor, but actually the field learned a lot. I'd love to say that the, the kind of the nanotechnology hype that was there in 2010 around these it has really been something similar where everybody was talking about nanotechnology, a lot of funding and so on, but then actually didn't really materialize. Uh, and, you know, the, there's been a lot of talk about graphene, nanotube, and all of those things, but we're not seeing them very much in practice today. Do you think that we're on the cusp of these becoming more of a reality, the same way synthetic biology has become reality after the biofuel bubble that we have now, we're at the beginning of this new phase? Do you see this coming? And if yes, why, or if not, why? I mean, you're right. We had the dot bomb failure and then nano became almost like a bubble ready, ready to, to burst. I do think there are some successes in nano sensors, nano deliveries. Again, I think of pharma as sort of the, the hip cousin to the chemical materials industry and, uh, you know, really well funded. Um, I do well, think- They have some... margins that everybody else can dream of, come on. <laughs> It's, it's easy when you have those margins. I know, I know. Um, but there's a demand, right? And again, back to ethics, we need to think about if we really, should we be questioning the cost of some of our, our, our drugs? And anyways, that's for another time. The, I, I do think we're at the cusp, as long as people were very, very specific what they wanted to bring on the market. Yeah. And, um, there's a value to the almost nanobomb and that is the amount of research and basic research that was done in our understanding sometimes we as humans don't know where we're going to apply that knowledge that we learned today in the future and i think that i'm glad that as a humanity we have that body of knowledge underneath us like how to grow nanotubes how to grow them in forests how to separate them if they're semiconductor or metallic um, what the hell to do with graphene which has technically been under our nose all these years, lighter, stronger, faster, cheaper. Why not? Um, I don't see, I'm, okay. I'm glad it exists. Okay, I think we need to open for yeah. questions. So Sarah, and over to you. Yeah, so we have a lot of questions here and I'll take them one by one. Uh, the first one, let's take from Johannes uh, and he asks, He's asking, how are you working with collecting data? Are customers willing to give away their data considering the potentially sensitive nature of it? Um, right now, we're more interested in uh, their problems, whatever it is that it might be. Like with Cora, for example, they had dreamt up 2,300 possible chemicals um, for a lubricant application and they just hired us to rank them. So we built a web portal. Uh, they wanted to know three things, boiling point, vapor pressure, and viscosity. That's how a liquid runs. And then we ranked them. We told them to that these are the top four and they made them and our prediction was accurate. So that was, we did that in three months. It would have taken them years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Besides that 2300, there was no data transfer. Um, for BP, they wanted to know a, a synthetic route for a green monomer that would be polymerized. This monomer is known. They wanted us to find a cost uh, effective route to, to make it. So again, there was no data that was transferred. We see in the future that, especially through our secure cloud, that the big companies can actually work together through our secure cloud on very large, tough problems. Um, 
and I think it's a, um, you know, you know, let, let's, let's talk about data for a second, right? I feel like data, if it's your own data, you think it's like the best. It's the absolute best. It's like your baby uh, just multiplied by millions. And the, the thing is, the data may not be compatible with how we're looking at it. And that's the fallout I'm hoping from ushering in this new age of innovation, that we standardize how data is captured, kept, monitored, secured. And um, there's a lot of redundancy. And then we've seen this in other industries. There's a lot of um, bias in this data. I mean, the dirty secret in science is that papers and patents are horribly reproducible. So why would you use those for building your database? And why would you use them to You'd be literally infecting your AI software if you didn't spend some time cleaning it out. So we do spend a lot of time creating our own data. We can't do it in everything, but many things. Like, again, for the biological, you need that toxicity testing with a living thing. And um, But we're hoping we'll get there, and we are working on a toxicity predictor. Um, Usually we just want their problems. We don't want their data. I think in the future when there's more trust, we can share their data, but right now we just want their problems because of the sensitivity around how people feel about their data. And pharma, that's actually already tackled. It's, it's the industry as a whole that has to get comfortable with this. Sarah, are you still there? You look like you froze. Yeah, he looks frozen on my end too. Okay, then I'll step in um, with a question of mine. Um, I'm giving you a magic wand. What would you do with that right now? Only for only about materials development, no other topics. What would be the magic wand, and how would you use it? Oh. Well, I'd go for the holy grails, right? A clean refrigerant, um, cure cancer, no hunger, clean up our oceans, a truly recyclable plastic. Okay, okay, okay. How you do it with the materials? I want to go more specific about what would be that would bring, what are you lacking to be able to get there? Um, I would need those dedicated projects would need more manpower. So it requires more money and it's okay. something we'd probably be looking at in the, in the B or the C, um, the B will be doing next year, the Q1 I want to raise because I'll be nicely flush with cash at the end of the year. And I like to raise when I don't need to in order to really scale and become operational and leave startup land behind. But with a magic wand, I like the idea of refrigerant. It's just not going to fit into an 18 to 24 month timeline. And uh, but happy to partner with someone to to do that. And same with the uh, truly recyclable plastic. There is a lot of um, we have to, I think, as a humanity, really decide what some what it means to be green, right? What does green really mean? And there are so many different definitions. Like, is it green because you started from something that wasn't oil or natural gas? Or is it green that you can bury it afterwards and it recycles? I mean, there's, there's these vast differences um, on what it could mean to be green. And I think we need to decide what that is, product dependent. Um, um, I think we need to clean up some of our messes and we owe it to our kids and our grandkids to do so. We're not leaving this planet better than the way we found it. Sarah, you, back to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Massimo. So we have another question. From, we have a question from Minachi. And uh, what AI and software developers is using can it also be used to design water soluble molecules? Um, so Rob, it was too, too grumbly. Can you put it in a chat somewhere? Maybe I can read the question. 
uh, let me ask one more time. Do you hear me now? Yes. So what AI and software Scabotics is using to design new molecules? Can it be used to design water soluble small molecules? Water soluble molecules? Yeah, can it be used to design water soluble molecules? Yes. I don't I don't see why not. We are tackling and looking at um, solubility all the time and also solution chemistries and things like that. It, I think it would have to depend on what it is that we we wanted to know, and then we'd be tackling it the same way that we always tackle it, um, trying to do it as quickly and as best as possible, and sometimes even as cheaply as possible. Okay, then over to the next question. What would be the main impact of this new way of designing new chemicals? I think we touched upon it a bit. In which industries uh, to develop new products or to reduce cost, etc. I kind of see it across the board. Uh, I don't think one one is better than the other. I mean, the the most impact would really be in in drugs, right? And that's what we would like to do after the B is have a daughter company that I've named Foundation Pharma, separate CEO, separate team, separate fundraise, where we give all the tools that we built at Cabotics over to Foundation Pharma, who does this for drugs. And the reason why that's really beneficial also to Cabotics is we're looking at a lot of ag and pesticides, et cetera. And that's a small organic molecule. And a drug is just a small organic molecule. And, you know, Cabotics has to think about specificity to kill a certain weed. And Foundation Pharma would have to think about specificity to kill a certain virus, for example. And we both have to think toxicity. So again, it, it is more data into this AI brain in order to do better and better choices. So I think probably in the pharma space, but we, 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 you have to master what you're good at first and dominate it before you, you move on or, or, or bring that capability in-house. And I would prefer it actually to be a separate entity. Thank you, Jen. Um, this is a question from me. So I, I realize you're also working with biocrop protection. C can you talk a bit about that? What, what is the project? Um, let me think of what was allowed to be said in the press release. Um, so I... It's more sort of R&D chemistry for agro applications. It's um, around food safety. I'm sorry, I'm sometimes limited as to what I'm allowed to, to be talking about. No We're issues, we can. We, we can. Uh, chem OS for that. Uh, and it's really to the idea is to reduce the food crop loss, which is massive, whoops. Thank you. Uh, we, we Let's take another question then. Uh, according to you, what are typical corporate bottlenecks uh, in the discovery process that AI and robotics are overcoming? How do you do it? I think we touched upon it a lot. Yeah, so the, the main bottlenecks really are the, the slowness of it. And each step is slow. And, the, you know, I mean, during my PhD, I felt like I... I, I failed 16 hours a day, you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting um, way of living. And then I think sometimes scientists make really good entrepreneurs because you don't look at it as failure anymore. You look at it like, oh, look, that didn't work. So now we get to that moment much quicker using the AI and robotics. Um, and I, this discovery of new materials will also have a massive impact on m many industries and and fields. I think the bottleneck really is, you know, focusing on the areas that we want to be focusing on, the sustainability and um, improving public health ultimately and eliminating all these toxic materials. Those are, those is what I see some of the bottlenecks. Um, I would like to see more machine learning experts out there who, um, 
who know something about chemistry or materials, that would be great. And certain data engineers. And um, we're working with some institutions and I know the Canadian government is really trying to turn Canada into the AI hub of the world. So they're, they're really funding and putting out this type of talent. So we do have a subsidiary up in Canada as well for said reason. Okay, let's take, a, let's take one last question. So this is from Kalpna and she wants to know if you have any favorites while working with other industries, what if they are like sustainable processes or environmental friendly processes that you like in particular? And if so, what are those? I mean, I'm super happy with the, the bear crop protection. Like from day one, we always wanted to be in ag. I like actually all the partners. Um, and uh, we just did a customer survey. They like us, which is uh, really nice to know. Um, it's very exciting. It, it kind of feels like them and Kabotics were like us against the problem that the world has. And it's, it's just, uh, it feels good. As a, as a human being, it's, robotics is a great place to be. We have great customers. Um, I like all the projects. Is there one I don't like? No, I like them all. They all have some great, awesome functions and I'm just happy to um, be able to deliver on them on time, on budget. Thank you, Jill. Um, so th with this, we would like to Say, uh, I, I would like to finish this session. Thank you, Massimo, for being here for this absolutely, absolutely amazing discussion. Thank you, Jill. Um, and I hope the audience learned a lot about how to explore the chemical universe ex efficiently. For the people who would like to re see a replay of this session, this session will be available on YouTube link of Hala Tomorrow's core, uh, core, and uh, you can watch the session again. And Jill, I will send you the session as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sharoop, Massimo, audience. Bye. -bye. Bye.